Chris, thanks for doing the show on uh, December 30th. No problem. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Chris, I don't know, we just want to talk about that uh, the movie. What can you tell us about the movie, when it's coming out, and uh, what your role was in the movie? Throughout uh, mid-April, unless it tests really well, then they're going to try to push it off till the summer. Um, so I think they were talking about April 17th, somewhere around there. Uh, I was originally hired, actually sent out there by Art Bischoff, um, just as the wrestling coordinator, uh, same thing I did on the Jesse Ventura story. Basically, just uh, I would co- coordinate all the wrestling moves in the matches, and I'd be kind of a liaison between the movie people and WCW. But uh, as it worked out, Oliver Platt is the main actor in the movie, plays the main character. And uh, once I put on a fat suit, I pretty much matched him, so I ended up being the stunt double for the main actor. Um, other than that, I just put together all the matches and, uh, you know, pretty much did uh, anything that you see with wrestling, I had my hand in it. How much how much of the movie is wrestling? How much is 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 not wrestling? And how and how, what WCW wrestlers are uh, you know most more featured on the show? Pay Diddy Pay is the uh, main bad guy, the main heel in the movie. Um, Goldberg's in it, probably the second most. Uh, then you have Disco, Mean Gene, uh, Kidman, Booker T, uh, Hammer, Bam Bam Bigelow. Uh, Show as old as I'm forgetting. Tanay and. Uh, and Shivani did commentary. Um, I think that's about it. What type of um, like like were there like different clips of action as far as like uh, WCW guys like uh, you know like you would like come up with okay I want to have this kind of a looking match to, to fit like I don't know if it's like a wrestling scene or something or um I don't think with the Kidman uh, a lot of times they would just if it didn't involve either Page or Oliver Platt. Um, it was pretty much just kind of background action, uh, action to be taking place beyond, behind actors and, um, you know, and just to give quick little quips. And for that, we used uh, Mysterio and Prince and Kidman and uh, Hoovy. And uh, mm-hmm. it was supposed to do, I pretty much left it up to them because, you know, there's no way I could come up with the stuff they can do. And, you know, I don't want to tell them what they can and can't do in a movie. I mean, this is, you know, how many chances are they going to get to be in a movie? So I told them whatever you guys want to do and... They went out there, and they're supposed to do about a minute of action. They ended up doing like three minutes, and they did it in front of a live crowd. For you know, they let all the people into the Grand Olympic Auditorium, and pretty much a full house, and the place was going nuts for them because the stuff they did was phenomenal. So I think they ended up using a lot more of that than they planned on using because it was so good. Did they do something like Kidman do? I mean, not Kidman, uh, Hoovy doing like drop kicks off the top of ladders and things like that. Um, there's one scene where uh, I was actually climbing up the ladder, playing you know the, the lead character, and. Uh, Hoovy and another actor were supposed to come in and push the ladder over. But Hoovy insisted on doing the springboard drop kick, which since I was on the ladder, <laughs> I was in a lot comfortable way because, you know, it's a dangerous spot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, he insisted on doing it. And I told him, you know, there probably nothing has ever won taken a movie, ever. I said, you know, something like this, you're going to want to do this at least three or four times, maybe, you know, ten times. And he still seemed cool with it. And sure enough, the more he did it, I think the more he was getting hurt because he was landing pretty solid on his... Uh, it was a real ring. It was one of our rings, so you know he was used to the ring, and he nailed it perfect every time. But you know it's it's movies; they got to get different camera speeds and different angles, and you know he ended up having to do it a bunch of times. No. Again, it was his call, you know. And I, I almost and I was going to really put my foot down on that one and say, "Hoovy, we're not going to do it," because you know it was real dangerous. I knew it was going to be hard, but you know he pretty much pulled me aside and said, "You know how many? Basically, what I said earlier: how many chances am I going to get to be in a movie?" Let me do this. You know, when he says something like that, I'm like, well, if it's something he wants to do, I don't want to stop him. Now, is there any reason, like, you were picked um, um, as far as, like, to do the Jesse Ventura movie and then this movie, um, as far as the stunt coordinating above anyone else? Um, did you have a background in that, or was it just something like Eric was, Eric had to pick someone and, and you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think it just stemmed back to uh, probably originally I helped train with Malone and Rodman when they did that stuff because Paige was involved and he got me hooked up with that. Um, through that, because of my involvement with them, I also got hooked up when I was training uh, um, with Leno. And then when NBC wanted to do the Jesse Ventura movie, they went to Leno's people and asked to work with him. And he mentioned me, so they kind of requested me for the Ventura movie. And once I did the Ventura movie, I had the movie background. So when the Warner Brothers movie came up, I was the obvious choice. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Shane Helms was also out there, one of three count. 
shooting yeah. from three count. He was out there, you know, as much as I was and did as much work as I did on it. Um, now, were you kind of instrumental? I had heard that you were kind of instrumental in, in bringing in a lot of the cruiserweights into uh, WCW as far as the power plant type of guys, and maybe, I don't know if, if, if you were instrumental as far as Shane Moore and Shannon Helms. Yeah, or, um, basically right before, uh, probably two months before Eric uh, was released or whatever happened there, he asked me if I could find some cruiserweights. He had some kind of idea to use just the whole crew of cruiserweights. So he asked me to find ten, basically young-looking is what he really wanted, 19-year-old-looking cruiserweights. So um, I ended up getting so many tapes and so much great talent out there. It was actually pretty easy to find ten. I mean, it was hard to narrow it down to ten. There were so many others. Uh, a few people, like Reckless Youth, who's really good, he just had bad timing. He had done a, uh, well, maybe good timing because most of those guys got released anyway, but... He had just done one of those tryouts with WWF, so he had like a 90-day or 120-day no-compete. So we couldn't even really talk to him until that was over, and by the time it was over, we'd already found the 10. So. Now, was uh, was the guy who's uh, like uh, Tony Marinara? Yeah, he uh, was one of them. Was he, was he, is he the standout of that group, or, or were there a couple of standouts? Um, it's a strange mix. Like Shannon and Shane, well, Shannon, uh, actually more Shane, He's very experienced for such a young-looking cruiserweight. I mean, he's been working independence for somewhere between seven and nine years already. Really? He's a lot more polished than Tony is. he looks so young. Yeah. Yeah, he is pretty young, but he started real. Even Shannon, I think, has been doing about four or five years, and he's really young. But those guys are friends with the Hardy Boys and the Carolinas, and they've just gotten into rings very early, doing, you know, basically backyard matches, but in rings in front of people. So they have, a, you know, a long time of experience. Tony Marinara just, of all the cruiserweights I've, I've seen looking at, through the tapes and trying to find these guys, Tony had, for an independent guy, an unbelievable amount of charisma. And for the look he has, he just somehow got to people to react in every match I've seen. I saw a bunch of his matches. And uh, he just he goes out there and just has fun and relaxes. I think, I don't know if the Tony Marinara character is really that great for him because he doesn't seem as natural now as he did on the tapes I've seen. Uh, but I think his potential is still there. I mean, once he gets, if, if they if they let him work, and I, you know, if I, he's had some health problems, if he can work, I've, you know, I've I've made a career out of bumping. This kid's one of the best bumps I've ever seen. He's taken bumps that I just my jaw would drop. Like, how did he get up from that? You know? Yeah, yeah, because like with with him, I mean, I had heard, you know, and it's it's you know, I'd, I'd never seen him work, and then I'd heard from people, and I guess it was indirectly power plant stuff about, like, you won't believe how good a worker he is, and then we see him in this in this role where he never works, and I'm going, like, well, you know, like, why don't they put him in a match if he's, if you know, like, if, if your talent is in the ring taking bumps, you know, uh, why is he a manager, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, th- I think part of the reason for that is, you know, the health problems he's had. Um, he's had a few concussions since he's been here already, and once that stuff happens, you take a risk every time you step in there. Yeah, that's um, true. No, I, I think, you know, you mentioned he's a great talent and he's not being used. I'm not even sure if Russo and Ferraro know how good he is. I don't know if they've ever seen his tape of him bumping. Um, you know, it's just hard. I, I, there's so much talent in WCW that at times it isn't used to the fullest potential, you know, like like Vandenberg, for instance. To me, I mean, if you look at his Smoky Mountain tapes, I mean, those are some of the funniest and best interviews I've seen, especially at his level at that time. It was unbelievable. And, you know, when he managed me as Mortis, you know, he did maybe two or three interviews on the air. You know, to me, that's a, that's a guy that, you know, he was let go and everything. And, you know, me and, and DDP and Terry Tell and a few other people are trying to work to get him back in because, I don't know, managerial, managers in wrestling, it's almost like a lost art. And I, I think if you look back to the 80s, I mean, that's what really got people heat. You know, you'd bring somebody in and put them with an established manager, they were over. You know, and I think if you just build up a manager, you can still do that. Well, if you had, like, uh, I mean, I don't think there's any question that, that uh, the AWA, as far as on the heel side, for years was carried by, by Heenan. Oh, yeah. And yeah. even WWF in the 80s. I mean, you would bring well, in a new Albano face. Albano and then Blassie and them. Yeah, yeah you bring in a new face that nobody ever seen. You put them with Blassie or, or the Grand Wizard or, or Lou Albano, and you knew they were something. You know, and then with Macho, you had everybody vying for them. And then he came out with Elizabeth, and it got her over and got him over. You know, same thing with Bam Bam. They had to battle for Bam Bam when Bigelow first came in. Right. You know, and it's it's just, I don't know if you could do it now because managers have been so diluted and not given the mic time and not been featured. But I think, I don't know, that's something I think I would try. And if I had to pick one guy, it would be Vandenberg. 
Well, you know, you came back a couple of weeks ago to WCW, and they brought you with, um, I guess, what's it called, Jay Biggs? Yeah, Jay Biggs. Think. What was, uh, is that someone, who, was that their call, or was that someone who you knew? No, that was Russo's call. I guess okay, he knew so. him from, uh, you know, when he was up in WWF as Clarence Mason. Right, right. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know where Russo got the idea, but to play up the Hollywood idea was all his. You know, do the Hollywood thing, and, you know, the whole uh, champagne you know, women, cars, the, the clothes and everything. And he said, you know, we should bring in an agent. It's going to be, you know, the Clarence Mason guy. And, uh, you know, it worked. Um, I don't know if Vandenberg would have fit into that role because he was already known as something else. And I you know, tried to push him off as an agent. You know, this guy was at least on camera known as a lawyer. So a lawyer agent, you know, that, not that big of a stretch. Yeah. There, there, we, had, we actually had an email in this morning, and it has to do with this, and it was about James Vandenberg. Um, do, you, do, you, do you keep in touch with him? Oh, yeah. I guess you're, yeah. What, is, he going, is he in with ECW, or, or what's the status? Because he was on ECW TV a few weeks ago, but kind of like been on ice, it seems like. Yeah, I, I don't know if him and Paul have actually sat down and worked any kind of deal out. Um, you know, they've talked on the phone a few times, and he brought him up for that shot, and it was kind of a, a last-minute idea when he, when he made the Mortis Wrath comment. You know, it was kind of, you know, and I've been around Paul, you know, in the early days of ECW, and that's how he is. I mean, He'll be watching the show that he just booked, and I'll go, no, no, you two go out there and, and jump in and tell him to do this. And, you know, he does a lot of his stuff on the fly, at least when I was there. And apparently when he used Vandenberg, it was the same type of deal. And, you know, Vandenberg, you know, he, he needs to make a living. And, you know, he just, he's just he been trying to get in touch with Paulie and trying to get booked on his shows. And, you know, Paulie's a busy guy. I mean, he's got so much to do with that program. So, you know, it's just, uh, he's trying to make a living, and, you know, he's, like I said, I want to get him back into WCW because I think he's untapped talent. I'm really surprised that uh, WWF hasn't picked him up. You know, it seems yeah. like, you know, maybe maybe because he doesn't have boobs. <laughs> you know, he's, you know, I said to go get some implants and maybe the man, it. the man with implants, that's gonna be. That's gonna be <laughs> Don't put it past him. He might do it. Hey, they got the head. They got the head pangers in there with falsies already. So, <laughs> be a perfect match, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. What's um when now you grew up uh, in New Jersey, right? Grew up in New York City. Actually. New York, oh, New York City. Okay, okay. And uh, you, obviously, you were a wrestling fan from from childhood. Um, what what was your start? Because I mean, the first I had heard of you was uh, you you trained under Moolah, right? Actually, I trained in a, a gym in Manhattan before that called the Lower East Side Wrestling Gym. I was run by a guy named Pete McKay and uh, a Bobby Bold Eagle, and uh, it was just. Uh, you know, low east side of Manhattan, so it was, you know, a lot of Hispanic, and it was a Hispanic kind of run gym, and basically, it's, it's a long story, but uh, John Arezzi, I guess, used to have a radio show, and he was going to have uh, Cactus Jack on. My cousin was going to buy stuff from the radio show to uh, give me for Christmas, and Arezzi said, well, why didn't you come down and meet Cactus Jack? And my cousin called me up, I went down there and met him, and we met a news, a little news uh, newsletter writer, young kid, his name was Evan or something, and he... Uh, my cousin was looking to buy the ring to put it in his backyard because he was almost as crazy as I was. And, you know, he gave me the address of this gym, and I went down there to really inquire about buying a ring. But, you know, since I was 13, I had known I wanted to do this, and I was about 21 at the time. And uh, I saw the ring, and, I, you know, I, I, Pete saw me staring at the ring. He goes, you want to get in? And I jumped in. I started bumping around. And he goes, why don't you come back Saturday and train with some of the guys? And that's pretty much where it started. I trained for a few months. I had my first match, and... Graduated college and went down to South Carolina to work as a physical therapist, and that's where I met Vandenberg, and he introduced me to uh, Moolah. I started training with her and doing her shows, and from there, Vandenberg got me to Smoky Mountain. From there, I got uh, moved up to Pennsylvania and trained with Alpha at his school, and from he got me into WWF to do job matches, and I did some ECW on my own, and then went to Memphis, and from Memphis, I went to WCW. Now, what what names were you uh, using before WCW? Because the I remember you as, as as Chris Canyon in, in WCW. My my earliest remembrance of you was at uh, Bash at the Beach in Huntington Beach against uh, Mark Merrow, Johnny B. Bad. Yeah. Where, where I think you had like the best match on the show, but it was on uh, WCW Saturday Night before the show started. Right. It, was, it wasn't the greatest show in the world. Much, I know. <laughs> but um, but that was where I mean, for whatever reason, I don't even know what it was. That, like you kind of caught my eye, and then they did give you kind of a push as yeah. men at work and things like that. But you know, they'd start a push, but they never let it really go anywhere. What what month was that? Do you remember? Was that May? 
Uh, well, the Bash mm-hmm. at the Beach would have been would have been July of uh, 90, yeah. would mean 95, I'm thinking. So, so I would have been there already two months. So I had done some job matches. I had done about six TV tapings before I went out there. Uh, but I wanted to go to California so bad. I had a, uh, one of my college roommates was living out there, so I went to Jody Hamilton, who was pretty much in charge of um, you know uh, booking the enhancement talent at the time. And I begged him, I said, please send me out to California. So he did, and uh, you know I got on that show. So just to be flown out there, I, I, maybe that's why some people noticed me. But it's funny you mention because as soon as the match was over, I had about three or four people come over to me and said, man, that was real good. You know they should really do something with you. Well, Bobby Heenan was one of them. Came out of his trailer just to find me to tell me that, and you know, I just, I don't know, I, I, I was just in such a great mood, and you know, I, I saw it as a great opportunity that was, wasn't on pay per view, but basically, you know, basically was a pay per view show, and you know, I just, you know, worked with Johnny B. Bad, and I, I loved to work with him. I got along with him really well, and you know, we matched, and we had a good match. It was quick; it was about a two, two or three minute match. But I had actually been in WCW for two months before that, and. And before that, every match I had ever had, WWF, USWA, Smoky Mountain, was always Chris Canyon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in ECW when I was up there. It was one of Cactus and uh, Mikey Whipwreck just won the tag belts mm-hmm. there during that period. And when I went to WWF, it was right. My first match up there was against Diesel, you know, Kevin Nash, and it was about a month before they gave him the strap. And, you know, they told me, go out there and make him look real good because we're going to put the strap on him. You know, and he just lost a pay-per-view match the night before. So I had to really get, you know, really shined him. I mean, it was all just, you know, he totally jobbed me out. But, you know, I bumped my, bumped my ass off from him. And, you know, he looked really good. So that got me in up there. And Russo said he remembered me from that. You know, and he said back then he even went to McMahon and tried to do something with me. And, you know, McMahon didn't see anything in me. So that's why I didn't last up there too long. Yeah, because, um, yeah, they'd given you, like, the a couple of, I would, would I say, like, minor pushes, like, with Mark Starr. And then, and then the Mortis thing was, I guess, the first... Semi push. Yeah. Um, that you know, was, when, and that was DDP. I mean, the meta work thing wasn't going to go anywhere, and it was, you know, at least it was a gimmick. It was something where I wasn't just one of the guys that comes out. At least we had something with us, me and Mark. We had some good matches, especially against American males, and, you know, it was Bishop's idea to do the glacier thing. The blood runs cold. He, saw it, he really did see it as the next big thing. He really wanted to push it. Oh, he's pushed like crazy. Yeah, he really thought, I mean, and he was small because he, he saw it with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and. Power ranges, and it was basically groups of martial arts things that the kids were getting into. So he said, I, you know, we had that. We could do that. Let's get some karate people out there. And, uh, you know, when I first was, uh, originally it was Glacier. You know, Ray Lord was first hired for it. And then he was looking around. He was going to put, I guess he always had his mind on putting uh, Ernest Miller in it. And then uh, it was DDP that got me into it. You know, he went to Bishop said, you need this guy to make, you know, Ernest, you know, his really green look good. And, you know, McRae look as good as he can. You know, you need someone out there that's going to bump for him. And uh, three times Bischoff agreed and then pulled pulled me out. And I finally came down to the power plant, watched me and Glacier work a little bit, and he's like, he went over the page and said, yeah, you're absolutely right. This guy's going to make, you know, our guys look really good. So I was pretty, again, you know, it's my job. It has been almost my whole career to go out there and make people look good. That's pretty much what got me to Glacier, you know, into the blood with the coal gimmick. And, uh... You know, it was, it was Bischoff's call to take the mask off at that time, too, when we finally took it off. He's like, you know, I, we can't push a mask guy. He goes, you know, and to me it was, it, was a, it was a gimmick that we could have pushed. I mean, to me it was the predecessor to Kane. I mean, if they would have pushed me like they pushed Kane, I think I could have got maybe not as over as he was, but definitely a lot more over than I was when they took the mask off. You know, and the, I had, funny th- the funny thing is is that it, I, I remember Kane does that certain look. And of course, that was the thing. The first time I remember seeing that was with you and Raven. You know that that confused sort of look with the mask guy with the long curly hair. Right. Yeah. I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I watch my stuff. You know, I tape all my stuff and I, I watch my old tapes as Mortis, and I definitely see a different style that I used to work with that mask on. You know, and it, the Mortis character to me was real marketable. You know, you know, I, I always joked that I always said, you know, we can't market skulls on T-shirts. You know, because Stone Cold sold sold. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if Everett's ever actually said that, but they never did market mortis. And to me, it was a gimmick that we should have been, you know, at least directed towards kids. And, you know, uh, but even, you know, we could have sold it to anybody. I mean, skulls are cool. I mean, the mortis gimmick to me looked cool. It was something that we could have marketed a little better, I thought. But we did not. We've got, we've, got, we've got to head to a break. You know, the one thing I've, I've never figured out with wrestling is, is as popular as it is with kids, that they've never created a, a masked wrestling character before Halloween and gone full-fledged, you know, like uh, big time marketing as as like the number one kids costume because wrestling's big enough to where 
you know, if you had a mass guy who was really, really over, you know, kids would go, you know, as whatever it would be, La Parca or whatever, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Well, they, they um, did make came masks, didn't they, and sold them for Halloween? Um, yeah, I never saw any kids coming to my house, but you're right about that. But, it, you know, more of a, it wasn't really directly a Halloween gimmick. But, yeah, um, it was never really directed at kids, I don't think, either. Yeah. I don't think it was really a kids gimmick at first. First caller is Carlos from California. Carlos, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, guys? Is this Condor? Yeah. Oh, uh, you tracked me down. What's up, dog? What's going on, Condor? How you doing, man? I met you, uh, David, this is all right. I met you. You came over to buy socks. Yes, across from the gym. <laughs> I was working on the How you booth. doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing very good. As a matter of fact, I talked to uh, a couple of my partners about um, about meeting you, and they're very interested in talking to you. But going into something else, where is your where are the plans for for your character in Bam Bam and, and Paige now? Um, you know, the, the one thing we were so and uh, you know, I guess if I asked them and sat down and, and talked to them, they'd probably tell me. But I almost don't like to know too much too far in advance because things tend to change and. I'm the type of guy, once I know what I'm doing, my mind just spins too much. You know, I constantly overthink it, and I get set on my ways of what I want to do, and then when I, if I can't or we, we can't do it, you know, I get upset. So I pretty much just wait till I get there to find out what I'm doing week to week. You know, you get there and you find out if you have pre-tapes and stuff like that. and you know, That's the way I like to do it. You know, so I have no idea what I have. I would imagine a pay-per-view match. I don't know if they've announced that yet. Um, they haven't mentioned to me, but the way, the way it's going, I, I'd be surprised if we didn't work this pay-per-view. Right, right. I mean, yeah, and the, and the whole I, the angle of the, of the belt that you're having right now is that like to replace a TV belt or something? What is that for? No, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's going to be a belt that's going to be really in circulation. Um, I think it's going to be more like along the lines of uh, what DiBiase did back in the '80s and WWE. Oh, the million dollar belt? Yeah, I think it's going to be more of just something I wear, and even you know when I lose, I'll claim I didn't lose, or you know they cheated or whatever. I don't think it's going to be one that's actually going to be fought for, and you know. Exchange between guys. Okay, okay. Well, man, I just wanted to say you're doing a great job, man, and you're, you you've always been one of the best athletes in the company. Thank you, Carlos. And definitely, I appreciate uh, this time talking to you. And um, give me a call back, man. I definitely want to talk to you about that comic book thing. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, man. Take care, David. Uh, we're out in LA on the 24th of January, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, give me a call back. See what we can meet or something. All right, man. Okay. Bye. 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 -bye. Okay. Um, what do you, you laugh at, Dave? I know that's a friend of yours too. Yeah. Very <laughs> coincidental that he got on first. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to do with these callers. They just flash on the screen. Uh, <laughs> but, but um, what was I say? <laughs> um, do you know when when you come up? Because you know you you've come up with a lot of different moves, and then a lot of people have have, have copied them since then. Um, do you just like watch wrestling and just go, okay, like with that Russian leg sweep type thing? Um, hey, how about if we do it like this way or? Or yeah, I, mean, that's, I would say 90 percent of the moves I came up with are just from you know I, I watch it so much, and uh, you know it's, like you said it's just you watch it and you think well if I just move this and you know sometimes it's, it's guys make a mistake you know they they go for moving it and they do it wrong or they you know they slip and you see you see a different variation from there and you're like wait a second if, if he would have just spun a little bit more there he could have done this and I get a lot of it from that and. You know, a lot of, you know, we spend so much time in the gym uh, doing cardio and, you know, tanning. And, I mean, it's just a lot of free time where your mind can just start wandering. And, you know, if you think about it long enough, you come up with stuff. And then, luckily enough, I had the power plant and guys down there willing to take my stuff. Uh, you know, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Lash Lou was one guy that took a bunch. You know, a lot of my new moves came from working with him. And he helped me actually develop a lot of them. And, you know, he, if you notice, he comes up with a lot of good stuff on his own, too. Uh, now, where, did he, where, did, where did he originally come from? Um, I think he was living like in Alabama and just went through the power plant. Did the, uh, you know, I don't think he had any experience before he got down there. And just something he wanted to try. And I believe he's married with kids and everything. And, uh, wow. The one thing I, the one thing I really liked about him was about, you know, first of all, I would take my moves because a lot of guys wouldn't. Um, and he was real willing to do it. But I think he had like an hour and a half drive a day to, just to get to the power plant. He was there every day. Now, when you have that kind of dedication, you just know the guy's going to be something. And athletically, you can see he had something anyway. You know, I something. remember the, I remember the first time he ever appeared on TV. Um, you know, you're, whenever you see someone for the first time, you you just don't expect anything, especially like a no name, right? Right. You, you just expect someone to basically be beaten up and and look green in, in the process. And and he did two or three things where I'm just going like. You know, boy, there's something in this guy. Yeah, yeah I remember and, and he has the charisma that a lot of guys from PowerPoint won't have right off the bat. 
Yeah. You know, he has a certain, you know, he's the way he took to this Tony Marinara and Disco Inferno gimmick, you know, he's fit right in. I mean, it wasn't a stretch. And the first time you start talking on TV, it's a lot different than wrestling on TV. And, you know, he, he fell right into it and had no problem, it seemed. Are there guys at the power plant that, uh, you know, another, anyone else like a Lash LaRue or someone who's going to show up on TV someday? What about, like, some of the guys on WCW Saturday Night, um, you know, like uh, Alex Skipper or Kid Romeo or some of them? I mean, what, what, have you watched them or you worked out with those guys a lot? Yeah, I mean, not so much down the power plant, but there's, there's a local bar there in Atlanta that uh, used to, I don't know if they still do, but they were doing shows on Friday nights before I went off and did that movie. And uh, a lot of those guys are working there and... I mean, that's why a lot of them do show up on Saturday night and can have such good matches right off the bat. I mean, they work together a lot down to power plant, but they also get in front of people, which, you know, that's where you really learn. I mean, you could, you could have a quote-unquote five-star down to five-star match down to power plant. You get in front of people and freeze up. You ain't going to do anything. But these guys, a lot of them do go out and work, the, uh, work in front of people. I mean, the one problem that the guys in the power plant might have, it's not like, you know, I'm not saying I, I, I you know, a long time ago, got into the business, but you know, I went through the independence, uh, you know, in South Carolina, and then smaller TVs, and then Smoky Mountain, and ECW. You kind of worked my way up into one of the major two. You know, it was something I wanted to do. You know, and uh, these guys, I, I think they get it a little too easy that they get right on TV, and it, and it tends to give give them an ego right off the bat. And there's nothing worse than having an ego in this business because you know the guys have to work with you, and you go out there and right off the bat, the young guys from the power plant start having an ego. And they're not going to look good because people won't let them look good. And yeah. that's the one thing they got to be careful of. I mean, there's a lot of talent down there, and I don't know, there must be something in the water down there because they're all big. But, whatever, uh, happened, whatever happened to Robbie Rage from uh, High Voltage? Because I, I thought he had a lot of potential, and then he got hurt, and then I, re- then I just remember he came back, but then, but then they disappeared again. Yeah, he, I, I don't. I think when he came back, he came back too early and got hurt. You know, he just wasn't ready. I mean, mm. his injury is real severe. I mean, a really severe injury, and even almost. Eight, maybe eight months after his original injury, I still saw him in the gym with like cast on. He was just doing legs, but you know, I was almost doing a cast and stuff. So wow, it was a pretty brutal injury. I don't know if his surgery got botched too. I mean, that's not something I, you know, I'm not sure if that's what happened. But you know, a few guys that happened to too. You know, they got hurt, but then they went and had the surgery, and it, didn't, it made things worse. I don't know if that's what happened with him or not. But you know, I, I, I heard him and Kenny got let go. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, because I was just wondering if uh, somebody would pick. Because I, I, I just remember those two guys seemed to be before he got hurt. They seemed to be doing pretty well, especially him. Yeah, he was tremendously athletic. I mean, I like watching Kenny because he's funny out there. I mean, he's got that crazy right foot and he's just he's wild out there. But together, I thought they made a good team. And you know, Robbie's a, they're both really nice guys. But Robbie's out of control, nice and you know, it's just you know. Both of them looked great, and they were really progressing really well. I think they, they did a lot of time in Japan, which really helped them. They yeah, back yeah. Japan, and they were twice as good as when they left. Yeah. Let's go to Aaron in Ohio. Aaron, what's going on? Hi, Chris. What's up, Aaron? Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How you doing? I feel kind of silly because I had a bunch of questions ready to ask you, and you guys pretty much answered them. Well, but uh, no, I came up with a couple Dave more. A great interviewer. What's that? That's because Dave is such a great interviewer. Yeah. Um... <laughs> My first question is, who would you like to work with in WCW that you haven't already wrestled? Um, Bret Hart's definitely one of them. I grew up loving Bret, and you know, it'd be great to wrestle him again. I loved my matches with Benoit. It's one of my favorite matches have been against Chris. Um, you know, I, I helped train Kidman. I helped get Kidman in. We worked so much together, you know, up in office school up in Pennsylvania. And when he first came to WCW, we, we trained so much together, and I'm trying to think. I don't think we've ever had a match. No, we've never had a match on TV. We've had a couple of dark matches, but that's a guy I definitely want to not only just wrestle, I want to get into a program with Kidman if I could. That would be a lot of fun. Um, there's a bunch, though. I have wrestled with PG-13 when I was in USWA, and I'd love to work with those guys again. Vampiro is one I'd like to work with. Um, you know, I love working with Sad and Malenko when I work with them guys. I mean, that's the one thing about WCW. There's so much talent. There's so many guys that I'd love to work with. I mean, you get to the building and there's maybe a handful of guys you don't want to see your name across from. You know, and the rest, you know, it's all, it's all good. Okay. Um, do you like the direction that WCW is going with, like, the shorter matches and more skits? Yeah. I mean, to me, the, especially with the three-hour format, if they go down to two hours, uh, I, I think they're going to have to mix it a little bit more. Um, but 
for three hours, it was so long. They had to keep it, everything real short to try to move it along. They won't need to do that as much with the two-hour show, I don't think. Um, but to me, it was hard for me to sit through the three hours, you know, when I first went off to Hollywood. And by the end of it, I, I really started looking forward to Nitro again. It's because, you know, right. you're not going to like everything on the show. And as yeah. long as everything's short, the things you don't like, you're not going to have to sit through them that long. Um, there's, I think they can pick and choose who has longer matches, though. There's, there's some guys that can carry it, and they should let them carry it. Yeah, and I know it's like the Jarrett Kidman match was fairly long. Yes, and I thought it was great, but those yeah. were better matches in a couple of weeks. Um, but then you, you look back in the tournament match between Brett and Kidman, and it was like three minutes. Yeah. You know, that's one that should have definitely had more time. Oh, I mean, yeah. A Bret Hart match, to me, only gets better when it's longer. Yeah. He's one of the few guys that, I'm not saying he needs the time, but his psychology and the way he works, he works a lot better when he gets the time. Yeah, like that match he had with Ben Law a couple There's months some, ago. I don't know how he does it, but he, he yeah. knows how to build drama in every one of his matches, but he needs the time to do it. And very uh, few people. And my think, final question is, uh, who do you see as some of the future stars right now in WCW? Oh, there's a handful. There's a ha there's a bunch. You know, definitely Kidman. Yeah. Mysterio, if he can stay healthy. Um, you know, if Tony Mar Marinaro puts on some weight, he could probably Shane and and I think the three count gimmick can be really big. Yeah, I really like if that. If they put him on in the beginning, they got to keep him. On. To me, I would put him on in the first hour. You don't put him in the third hour. You know, the, the crowd gets tired and yeah. perceptions reality in this business. And you put him in the third hour and they're not getting a reaction. Everyone right. at home says, oh, they're not that over. But then when they go see him, they don't react. Yeah. Put them on yeah. early. They're going to get the reaction they need, and that will help get them over more. Yeah. Uh, they were in the third third hour this week, and they didn't get the reaction they did on the Thunder taping. Right. Um, but those guys are real good. They're, they're, but there's so many. I mean, there's a lot of good talent at the power plant. And there's guys like Jeff Jarrett who's really hitting his stride now, Benoit. And this is, you know, PG-13 I think can be phenomenal if they let him go and do their thing. and. This, uh, right. this is the one thing I love about this company. There's a lot of talent. Yeah. Well, I hope your wrestling is sold out because I, I got a ticket to that. So Up in Cincinnati, right? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I, I'm hoping me and Bam Bam, I think, but they haven't told me yet. But I have a feeling, I mean, they're not going to put the time every week that they put into me and Bam Bam doing our deal. And, you know, one way or the other, we got to end up on a pay-per-view, I would imagine. Especially if they're doing, they're doing like a 12-match show. Yeah, yeah, I would think they would have to. Although, I guess Chris is already involved in the th three different matches, right, Benoit? Yeah. And other than yeah, that, how true. many they announced? Six other ones? Uh, it seems like, let's see, those three, and then they announced uh, David Flair, a four-way hardcore, uh, you know, the, the um, Bret Hart match with Sid Vicious. Uh, it's four, five, six. So probably about, they probably announced seven, eight out of the 12. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine I'm going to be in Yeah, there. I think they're doing some, some cruiserweight thing with um, Medusa, and, uh, Medusa and Evan Courageous, I think maybe a three-way or something. Right. What do you what do you think as far as like when we were talking about that movie? What, what do you what are your thoughts of the movie as far as like are you excited about it? Uh, you no, think I read really the script good? and I hated it. And when Eric sent me out there, I mean I, I liked the Ventura script a lot more than I liked this one, and the Ventura movie didn't do that well. Um, but then you know I, I got to watch and film a lot of stuff, and you know it's all about who they put in it. And all the plants a tremendous actor, and David Arquette, you know, in this role was really really funny, and Scott Conn was good, and you know they have a lot of Martin Landau's in it, and Rose McGowan, and you know a lot of names and. The director's the guy who did Varsity Blues, and, you know, it's a big-time movie. And they spent a lot of money, you know, big budget, and, you know, it's big stunts. And, you know, it's it's, it's a lot different than the Ventura movie in that they, they spent a lot more money, and you'll see it. Uh, I got to see a lot of the wrestling they filmed, and the wrestling's going to be real good. I mean, we did some things I've never seen in wrestling before, and the way they filmed it was really well done. I mean, they put cameras where we can't put cameras, and, uh, you know, the slow motion, and, you know, they make sure they get every shot the way they want it, and, you know, Brian Robbins and the, uh, the director of photography did a great job. And visually, it's going to look great. Um, you know, and I, I think it's going to do pretty well. I mean, you think about how many people watch wrestling. If we can get, you know, I, I don't know, what do we get, about 10 million ho households on a Monday between the two companies? But not 10 million viewers. You know, it's about right, seven, 6, 7 million households, yeah. 10 million viewers, you know, figure if each one of them goes out and sees it, and that's just wrestling fans. That's, you know, seven bucks a pop, it's a $70 million take, so. Yeah. You know, $70 million, you know, it's real good. Yeah, that's so, a hit movie. Yeah, and that's just See, wrestling fans, and, you know, they get them marketed towards both. When they advertise on wrestling, they're going to show a lot of wrestling clips. When they advertise, you know, in the afternoons and, 
you know, at night on different shows, they're going to show more of the comedy, more of the acting. So hopefully we'll get, you know, you know, I'll, I'll be real happy if it does well. You know, I put a lot of time and effort into it and something I want to be successful. Yeah, you noticed that the one thing I was, was really interesting was the, the Andy Kaufman movie is they did separate commercials that were totally... Hello? Uh-oh. Am I up? Okay, we almost made it through a whole show without this thing cutting out on me, but we didn't quite get there. Oh, boy. You, anyway, we were, talk yeah, we were talking about... About Andy Kaufman yeah. movie? Yeah, the, I, was, I thought it was really interesting how the Andy Kaufman movie, they did separate commercials for the pro wrestling audiences, you know, compared to the commercials they ran for the rest of the TV audience. Right. That didn't do that well the first weekend, did it? It was fifth, but it did, uh, what number did I hear? Nine million dollars? It wasn't too bad, for, too for, bad for the first Yeah, it's not too bad. I saw it. It was it was okay. I I thought it was okay. I don't know. Did you see it? No, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I'm such a huge Kaufman fan that, you know, I talked to Disco Inferno, who's a huge Kaufman fan. I talked to Mike Tanay about it. They both have seen it. And today's argument was, you know, if you're a Kaufman fan, you've seen everything they've done in it. You know, that's everything in the movie. Nothing's going to be new to you. Um, but Disco loved it because he, you know, he said he really played up the Tony Clifton part. And he, said, and, and he was really, you know, impressed by uh, uh, Jim Carrey's performance, how much he acted and looked like him. Um, yeah, the, the, I, I thought the performance was really, really good. The... Um but, you know, I, I, I kind of like had the same thoughts as Mike Tanay in that um, when, when watching it, I kept mentally comparing. I, I had seen every scene, and I was mentally comparing it with the original, and I thought that it was a great performance that was close to, but in every case not as good, if you know what I'm saying. Right. So I guess you've seen the uh, I'm from Hollywood and... Yeah, all, all, the, all that stuff. Specials on them and stuff, yeah. All that, oh yeah, all that stuff. And then especially, you know, the wrestling stuff, I probably saw all that stuff like 50 times. Because, right. you know, back in the early 80s, I mean, it was just, you know, that stuff wasn't going on in wrestling, so those tapes were, you know, I would watch those tapes over and over again. Yeah. Um, let's go to David in New York. David, what's going on? Uh, hey, you know, we uh, talked to Mike Modis last week, and you said that when Chris was on, that we had to talk about how bad the Jesse movie was. <laughs> Chris, what was the story of that when you before when you were done with the Jesse movie? Yeah. Did you um? What were your thoughts like? Was it like oh geez, I I didn't like the script or was it or were you? No, what, I, what were your I, thoughts? I love the script of the Jesse movie. Really? Yeah, I thought it was a, you know, because like, that's something I haven't seen that much of. I, I wasn't that familiar with Jesse's personal life and you know I knew he claimed to be a Navy SEAL and all that stuff, but uh, but again it was I think part of the problem with the Jesse movie was it was it was a rush job and. We, we filmed it in just a few weeks, and you know, it didn't have the time, and you know, people just kind of rushed through it. I mean, it was just a made-for-TV movie, and the difference between a made-for-TV movie and, and a big screen movie is, you know, night and day as far as the attention to detail and money they spend, and you know, how much, you know, how much effort. Did, I mean, the people were taught on the Jesse movie, but they were also thinking about their next project while they were working on it. I think, where you know, everybody was focused during this movie, the Ready to Rumble movie. Now, um, how long? How 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 long was the total filming of of that movie, Ready to Rumble? Um, I mean, I, mean, they, I know they did like like the wrestlers were there for like about a month, and then what yeah, about everybody yeah, else? Filming, I think, was a, a fifty two shoot day. The actual days that we shot, I think, was fifty two or fifty three days. So it stretched out over about, uh, I guess, about two, almost three months shooting. Um, but to, to film a one minute to one and a half minute wrestling scene would take over an entire day. Wow! So it's like every angle and. It's just, it's amazing, the attention to detail. You know, everything that gets on camera is going to be what they want. I mean, it's... Uh, I just think it was amazing. Like, it was just so stupid, like, some of the stuff. Like, the whole wrestling with shadows thing in the movie. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, the, the, writer, the writer of the movie... The, beard. The, the writer of the movie had seen two things before they wrote it. I mean, it, was that, it basically was, you know, Jesse got elected the next day to produce, you know, one of the... Executive producers called up a writer friend and said, "Hey, you ever watch wrestling? Well, maybe we should do a movie about Jesse." And you now the writer, I guess, watched uh, Wrestling with Shadows and watched the uh, Secrets of Pro Wrestling, and it was awesome. oh yeah, Stomp Your Foot, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they really everything did do that. Of those movies was in it, and you know, you can't fault the writer. You know, they have to do their job. It's not their fa fault. They're not a fan. They're asked to write a movie about wrestling. They're not a fan. At least they watched, you know, at least one good thing about wrestling. Because you know, I've always joked. I've always joked about how it just seemed like the writers watched Wrestling with Shadows, Secrets of Wrestling, the Jesse biography, and they really did that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was. Real. If you watched it, it was real obvious. Oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, like, I mean <laughs> it was. 
and there was no way they were letting me change anything. I mean, at, <laughs> least, at least this movie, they actually let, you know, I took advice from me and Paige and some of the other wrestlers, and they did, you know, change a few things. And, you told me you know, again, I'm smart, but, smart. Uh, yeah, but you, you're not going to be able to, you know, they write, and the director has his vision, the writer has their vision, and they don't want some wrestler coming and changing it. So you stuck with what you got, you know, and, you know, you just make the best of, you know, you know, and, and either way, I was in a tough spot. I was going to get criticized one way or the other. I could have made the wrestling true to the, you know, 60s and 70s or whenever just true, true to the 70s. And it would have been boring. 70s, 80s, yeah. You know, and then people would have yelled at me and said, oh, the wrestling was boring. So then I went the other way. I was like, well, let's get some talented kids out here and, you know, put some stuff on screen that's going to look cool. And then I got criticized for that because it wasn't close to what Jesse and people of his era were doing. But to me, you know... Uh, the one thing I read after after the movie came out, I read in Daily Variety, which is like the Bible out in Hollywood, and you know, it, it, it pillowed the movie apart, but it said the wrestling was good. You know, the wrestling that was put on screen actually looked really good. So I was, you know, pretty proud of that. I mean, that's all I was really brought there to do. You know, yeah, the wrestling sequ- the wrestling sequences were good. I think just the, the the plot and just the, you know, there's another one where. Um, what's his name? Neil Stewart. You know, it's like I, everyone's seen so much of Jesse, and Neil Stewart was not really, you know, he didn't have Jesse's good qualities as far as you know. You know what I mean? Yeah, Jesse had I mean, like that that Neil, charisma that he. Neil's made a constant decision when he talked with the director, and they said, "Don't watch too much of Jesse. But I don't want you trying to imitate Jesse and come off as a bad Jesse imitator. Play the role as you read it." And you know, it's just a, a creative decision that Neil's and, and uh, the director made, and. You know, they might have been right. I mean, maybe it's Jesse wouldn't have been a great imitation if he tried it, and it came across as worse. I re- I just really hated the part. Where I think it was you under a mask, pile drove someone off the second rope. Yeah. And then they're in the back, and the evil promoter guy, he goes, something very bad happened tonight. Someone yeah. actually got. I actually hurt. tried to get Vandenberg into that role. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the promoter role? Yeah. I yeah, he'd have been good at that. Part. I mean, yeah, he was the devil. I wanted him to do it. <laughs> it would have been great. But yeah. Again, I mean, you can always you work with what you have. You know, you, you get, as an actor, you get a bad script, and you know, you go out there and you act, you know, as best you can. Same thing here. I mean, I, I, I didn't have a choice. I was told to do that movie. I went out and did it. I actually liked the script. You know, did I like the way it came across on TV? I think if they were given more time and you know, it would have been better. I, I enjoyed it, but I, you know, once you get that close to something, you can't be objective. You know, I knew all the people that, you know, I knew the people that did the costumes and the makeup, and I knew all the actors, and, you know, to me, it was just a bunch of people I knew working on a project together. Okay. Um, um, I enjoyed it, but, again, I can't be subjective. I was wondering what you were thinking back, I guess it was a year and a half ago, when Edge debuted in WWF, and a lot of people kind of said that he was ripping you off because he used a lot of your moves. Um... You know, if, if he did, if what he was doing was copying me, and I don't know if it is or not, I mean, I yeah, he's a creative like guy, a too. And, flatliner and that. Yeah, I mean, if he, if he was doing it because he uh-huh. watched my stuff and liked it, you know, it's a compliment. You know, yeah. I watch his stuff, and I love what he does. And at times, he's a lot more athletic than I am. I mean, I, I'm not going to run and jump over the rope without grabbing it, you know. He does stuff like that, and the matches he's had with the Hardy Boys have been phenomenal. Um, but, you know, Dave, we got to head out. We, we, Dave, we got to head out right now. Okay. Um, one last thing, I was wondering, okay, go is Vince Russo a big enough idiot to pr- want to bring back the Men at Work gimmick? <laughs> Hopefully not. Hope not. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think so. No, I'll don't probably so. have you get amnesia or something, and you'll start thinking you're more it is than Men at Work. And... No, 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 no. Um, let's, let's go to Alex in Detroit. Alex, I think you're going to be our last call for uh, the, the century. <laughs> I don't think, well, that's a good way to go down. Um, I have two really quick questions. First, how do you like going from uh, group to group? You know, you've been in the flock and then the triad thing. And second of all, how can you go on this boring show and you could be on WCW Live, the most listened to talk show, internet talk show? Oh, God. Oh, oh, oh so was Jeffrey Borash. <laughs> they got him on there. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, what was this? Did he have a real question in there? Oh, how do I like jumping from group to group? Yeah, just going, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's worked. I mean, I needed to go, you know, I thought I needed to join Raven at the time. You know, I, I needed to... Uh, be involved with someone that was getting over and getting a push. And that worked. And then the Triad was getting even a better push than that. So it worked, but now they think I'm better off on my own. So, you know, I, I like what we're doing so far. I like doing the commentary. I like, you know, using the bottles and I like the women out there with me. It's, it's a good presentation. It's good for the eyes. And you know, I'm happy where I am right now. They got, we got one last question here. This is an email question from Ryan Anderson who said, Are there any wrestlers in WWF or ECW that you would really like to work with? Um, 
Um, yeah, I, I, I wrestled the uh, well, one, two, three kid when I was up in WAF. Um, X Pac five, six years ago. I would have loved to wrestle him when he was here. Um, I'd love to wrestle him again. I'd love to wrestle with Edge and the Hardy Boys. And I love what they're putting out there. It'd be great to be part of that. Um, there's so much talent there. I'd love to work with Rock because he's so over it. would be easy. I'd uh, love to work with Mankind, you know, because I, I went to see that Beyond the Mat, and it's one of the best things I've ever seen in wrestling. Oh, that was awesome. Oh, yeah. I went to see it twice. Actually, I made the uh, producer and the director uh, sit down and watch it. They got a copy, a private screening for us. And uh, the producer and the writer of the, the movie of Ready to Rumble, they were blown away. They're like, we need to do something else with wrestling and something close to this. And they loved it. It was they couldn't believe how good it was. I I, I could I, I was I remember the first time Barry Blaston actually came over to my house and, and put this tape in and about halfway through I'm going like this is unbelievably good and he goes you like it and I go no this is unbelievably good. The whole time I'm watching I'm like you know this is really good but 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 Brett's movie had that great finish like this ain't gonna you know it's gonna it's gonna leave you flat how's he gonna end this and somehow the guy pulled out a great ending and I yeah. thought the finish when he went you know I don't want to ruin it but. When he when he met up with Cactus and his wife at the end, there it was unbelievable how well we put it together. I mean, if anyone wants to see the, that, you got to go see Beyond the Mat. Yeah, yeah, I thought the stuff with Jake was so phenomenal. That's that's when I that's, I remember it was when the Jake stuff, and I'm it went, and I just looked at Barry Blaustein and I just go, this is so good. Yeah, the Jake you know? stuff is great. Oh, so the Terry Funk stuff, the the guy who tried to become a referee during a Terry Funk match with Brett. Oh, that dead by play with Dennis Stamp, yeah. Oh, that was phenomenal. I mean, it's so so much. I don't know if I like it so much because I'm involved in the business, but I see so many of those people, or those types of people, and not just that guy, but like Terry Funk and Cactus Sex. I mean, they're everywhere. You know, I see those guys, but you see people like that. It's just great. I mean, it was just such a great cut of wrestling. Yeah. So many. You know, what's funny is, 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 is I, I, there are people who think that that's bad for wrestling, and I, I like disagree because I think that if an average person sees it, they come out with a lot of respect for wrestling. But it's just it's just what wrestling is. I mean, the good and the bad. It's it's fair, you know. It was right down. Yeah, I'll tell yeah. you, I was burnt out. You know, I was still working on the movie at the time, and I was even questioned if I really fully wanted to come back to wrestling. And I saw that, and it, I was like, I'm so lucky to be part of something this cool. I'm like, I can't wait to get back. And that one movie inspired me to, you know, come back and, you know, work my ass off again, like I've been doing. Because, you know, again, you, you're privileged to be part of this business, and I, you forget that sometimes. And, that movie reminded me, it's, like you said, it's the good to bad, but it's, it's something I've always loved and still do, and that reminded me of that. Well, thanks a bunch, Chris. We, have, we, we are out of time, and you are, you're our final guest of, uh, of the year, and I want to thank you very much on December 30th for coming out and doing the show. Well, how and better to uh, end the year and start a new year than with a little touch of champagne? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of everyone... Um, don't uh, don't do anything. Uh, just be careful on uh, on Friday night, and because uh, we want you all here back on Monday when we start the new year, and uh, follow what should be 2000 is going to be one interesting year in the professional wrestling business. I'm sure of that. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's going to be interesting. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Dave.